Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to welcome Dr. Wen Jung Lee, who is currently Chair Professor of Biomedical Engineering in the Department of Mechanical and Biomedical Engineering at the City University of Hong Kong. And uh, Dr. Lee is our seminar, Wen seminar speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Lee has BS and MS degrees in aerospace engineering from the University of Southern California, and he has a PhD from UCLA. Prior to joining City U, he spent two years at the uh, NASA JPL Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, then four years at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, where he was head of the Center for Micro and Nano Systems. Dr. Lee has published more than 300 papers in peer reviewed journals, and his professional achievements include six years as editor in chief of IEEE Nanotechnology Magazine, and he was recently elected to serve as president-elect of IEEE Nanotechnology Council, and he'll be uh, president of that organization in 2016 and 17. Professor Lee is also an entrepreneur, and he has co-founded three startup companies, commercial, commercializing uh, MEMS and nanosensor products. He's a distinguished overseas scholar of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and he has held honorary academic appointments at Peking University, Suchow University, and Huazong University of Science and Technology, amongst others. So please welcome Dr. Wen Jung Li for his seminar, Optically Induced Electrokinetics, a Digital Path to Cancer Cell Manipulation Patterning Differentiation. Welcome, Dr. <coughs> Thank you, Professor Parley. Thank you for that very uh, generous introduction. Uh, you know, it's my pleasure today to be in Canada. In fact, uh, you know, I made a big mistake. I bring too much clothes. I got to be honest with you that I grew up, you know, in Taiwan and then in California and in Hong Kong now, places that are very humid and sunny all the time. And I thought I was kind of scared, in fact, to come to Canada during middle of winter. But when I got here, you know, as you can see, I'm kind of sweaty now. I had to take out my thermal underwear. Like. So what I want to say is that this is an incredible campus. I, I, I've been to many great universities in the world. And I think this is one of the top ones, you know, just looking at the infrastructure. And after talking to many faculty members this morning, uh, also Professor uh, Carly, I learned that this is actually the Berkeley or MIT of, uh, equivalent to Berkeley or MIT of USA. So I'm very honored to be here to give my talk today. Uh, so my talk is really uh, interdisciplinary in a way that it's involves a lot of engineering. Uh, you know, I have very super superficial knowledge about biology. This is uh, all the biological science brought by my colleagues in, in uh, Hong Kong. So please bear with me if you're a biologist. Uh, but for an engineering aspect, I think uh, we can do a lot to uh, improve what biological scientists are doing today. Now, City University, you know, maybe many of you have not heard about it, but I'm sure you have heard of the up and rising Hong Kong universities in the uh, in world in the past, I think, 20 years. They have risen to the top in, in uh, Asia, especially. Hong Kong U, Hong Kong UST, you know, University of Science Technology, Chinese University. City U, in fact, is one of the top five research universities in Hong Kong. Uh, actually, it's very, very young. Uh, you know, it became a full university in 1994, so this is only our 21st year as a university. But we're already number one in Hong Kong in terms of scientific paper publications and, and citations. Number one in Greater China, better than Tsinghua University, whether you believe it or not. Okay? This is actually published by uh, some surveys recently. Of course, Tsinghua is much bigger than we are, but per capita, we are number one in all of China. Uh, number 11 in Asia, uh, you know, we're still kind of behind, behind other uh, Singapore, uh, Japanese university, and even Korean, okay? But anyways, we're, we could say that we're actually very good up and coming. But it's still a small university compared to Waterloo University. Now, I want to first of all thank my students, you know, from three different institutes that uh, I have uh, association with. Chinese University, where I worked for around uh, 15 years. Uh, the Sengyang Institute of Automation of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and also the currently at City University. So these students have contributed contributed to all the research work that I'll show today in the talk. I also need to thank my colleagues from Chinese University and also from Beijing Hospital. They have contributed in terms of uh, perennial blood cells and cancer cells for the research work that I'll be uh, talking about. Now, why do we need to manipulate individual cells? Uh, simply put. We need to separate different type of uh, bacteria, viruses, proteins, cells, so they could do one of these, you know, any one of these important things, things like diagnostic tests or drug delivery uh, discovery uh, processes. But what is the difficulty? Now, look at, look at this uh, chart. I think some of you are experts in biology. You could see uh, where I'm getting at. For example, circulating tumor cells. In uh, a liter of fluid, you get around 1,000 of them. 
by the microliter of uh, uh, blood. Okay, you get uh, red blood cells, a million of them. So we're talking about about one billionth in terms of ratio. Within one billionth of a uh, red blood cell, you're gonna find one can cancer cell. We have heard of the expression, finding a needle with a haystack, right? So that's exactly what we're doing when we try to find cancer cells, okay? So this is a very, very difficult problem. Of course, there are existing methods that doctors have uh, accepted already. Now, talk about cancer. In fact, cancer is not you know, your greatest, uh, the largest, uh, what do you call it, district by population. But the data is not very consistent. If you, you know, get a chance to look into, into this more, this is uh, from Wikipedia, and this is data from 2001, I think, okay, about 15 years ago. Uh, but by all measures, I think people understand that heart attack or heart-related diseases are the number one kill in the world for developed countries, like you know, Canada, Hong Kong, USA, and so forth. For Africa, some parts of China and India, AIDS and uh, diarrhea and so forth could be you know, very, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, has a very high mortality rate also, okay? Now, but this shows that lung cancer is the number one cancer killing, but this is not true. I mean, those of you in this research area, I think you know that liver cancer and pancreatic, pancreatic cancer is actually have a higher rate of mortality than uh, lung cancer. So if you add up all the cancers together, I think it should be top three uh, in terms of uh, killing, okay, humans. Therefore, it's important to uh, study this. Now, how do I get into this area of research? There was a, uh, doctor in the Chinese University of Hospital in Hong Kong, he came to me and said that you know, they, they want this new medicine and they're trying to cure this skin cancer. Because Asians are very uh, self-conscious, okay? They, they, they like to put these uh, you know, white cream on their skin, very expensive white cream. They want to stay white. They want their skin to be white. They don't want their kids to go out in the sun, okay? They think that if you go in the sun too much, you're going to catch cancer, okay? In fact, we found that since the Cancer Society of Hong Kong uh, came with data came with in 2012. In fact, Asians do catch cancer, even though they don't go in the sun. But they catch it later stages of life, okay? Uh, you know, compared to Caucasian colleagues. Uh, once they catch it, they have worst, they probably have the worst prognosis than uh, any other race in the world, okay? This is some, some data that Hong Kong society is uh, collecting these days. Uh, we, cannot, we cannot find any data from China, but we can extrapolate from information. I'll show you some information in the next chart. But in fact, in the US, 50% of all cancers in the US are related to skin cancer. Of that, you know, skin cancer or not, it's actually one of the lowest mortality rate uh, disease. Of that, uh, only 75,000 uh, in 2012 have this deadly, what we call melanoma cancer. Only around 12,000 each, each year uh, die due to this cancer. In Hong Kong, around 24,000 people catch cancer, okay, each year. Uh, this is around 0.35% of the population. We extrapolate that into China, that's around 5 million in, uh, in China. Now, Hong Kong research data show that this monetic cancer, you know, deadly cancer uh, disease in Hong Kong is 30 times less common than UK and USA, and 100 times less common than Australia. And of course, they, you know, they, they attribute this fact to that or oh, maybe Caucasian colleagues like to go in the sun a lot, right? We see in, in Asia during winter time, many Europeans go to the beach, okay? They enjoy the uh, beach life a lot. That's why they expose them to skin to, to, to sunlight. They're more likely to catch cancer. But in fact, that's not true. They also found that later in life, uh, Asians, especially Hong Kong people, they catch cancer, okay? Even in unexposed or non-sun exposed sites, and they're much, much worse than Caucasian skin cancers once they catch it. And therefore, there was a big motivation to study this in Hong Kong. Now, what causes these uh, bad cancers? It turns out that there are two major types of cancers, uh, skin cells, that is, in our skin. Monellocytes are the ones that are deep, they're buried deep in the skin tissue, okay? Keratinocytes, that's the majority of the skin uh, cells are keratinocytes. Monellocytes are the ones that determine the skin color. Now, so these are, when they go bad, they become a, uh, melanoma cancers, that's when these cells become cancerous, okay? And to the doctors, it's actually very hard to differentiate these two cells under the microscope. They have trifluorescence activated, uh, you know, cell sorting system, but they are very difficult, they are very low success rates, around 5%. And therefore, they were interested in using other techniques to try to separate these different type of cells. And that's when I started this work around five years ago. Now, electro electrokinetics, 
a, a simple explanation is that this is what happens to uh, or the study of motion of particles inside a ferritic medium under electric potential applied across the medium. Okay? There could be all kinds of phenomena that are associated with it. Uh, but the, the one that we, most of us have deal with, dealt with is uh, electrophoresis, applying some you know, DC electric field and hopefully the uh, acceleration of the different mass would go in different velocity could separate these different particles. Dielectrophoresis, in this case, we could even have dielectric particles where the field is, electric field is AC or non-uniform electric field now. There's electroosmosis where you uh, create, a, a, what do you call it, the uh, derby layer around the surface of uh, uh, your materials and that generates secondary motion okay, in the fluid. Also, electrothermal flows. When you apply voltage across a, a, flu a fluid, thermal current may heat up the fluid and create secondary motion in the fluid. Okay? And of course, there are all kinds of other phenomena that are associated with electrokinetics. And I will not go over these because these are not so dominant in the region of uh, forces I'll be talking about today. For those of you not familiar with DEP or, or dielectrophoresis, let me show you a basic video. Essentially, from an engineering perspective, if you create a non-uniform electric field, uh, this electric field gradient will, will uh, create a force on a particle. This particle does not need to be uh, conductive. It could be a dielectric. In a way, shifting the, uh, the uh, ions and electrons around the surface. So you can see that these cells could be attracted or pushed away from a certain uh, electrode, depending on the frequency. Okay? This force could be positive or negative depending on the electric field applied to the particle itself. Also the ferric medium, which is uh, in this what we call the CN factor. This, re this relates to the fluid conductivity and also the particle conductivity, and also the particle geometry. These are all factors affecting DEP force. Now, you can see from the previous you know, uh, video, you have these fixed electrodes, and that's not very flexible. Okay? What happens if you want to manipulate cells? Do you, want, do you want to create like, you know, millions of uh, these electrodes on the surface and position the cells individually? That would be very difficult, okay? So what we did was that we used something called optically induced dielectrophoresis. The concept is very simple. We deposit a uh, photosensitive layer on a substrate. So wherever there's a, uh, uh, a photo, what do you call it, a light pattern projected onto the surface of this photosensitive layer, you create a localized electric field as such you can create a field trap around the particle itself. This field could be negative or positive, just like in uh, general DEP force. Let me show you this video, show this concept. This is a microfarad chip top view. These are microbeads around uh, 10 to 100 microns. I forgot the exact size. And these are th patterns. In the bar, you see just the pattern. You, know, you can see that it's a negative DEP force. Okay. So you get the point. Imagine if these are biological cells. You can project light automatically where you see them under a the microscope. You draw a ring around them that creates a light trap. You can start moving these things back and forth. Okay. And you know, if you're interested, this is the engineering aspect of the, uh, the uh, system. Okay? So again, light projected onto a photoconductive layer or photosensitive layer that creates a localized electric field that allows you to trap these micro or nanoparticles. And of course, the force uh, applied around the particle depends on the frequency, also the voltage, also the phoretic medium and particles themselves. They you know, themselves have certain conductivity and permittivity. Those are also factors affecting the overall DEV force. <clears throat> now, you can see immediately that this, this uh, based on this equation for DEP force, the DEP force acting on a particular particle depends on the geometry. So if you have a big particle and a small particle, we can separate them very fast because they, they are under different uh, force magnitude. Okay? So you can immediately see this as a very fast way to separate different sized particles or different particles of different permittivity uh, properties. Of course, just like in regular you know, electro DEP, you, gotta be, you have to consider electrothermal force and electroosmosis and so forth. Meaning that you gotta pick the right frequency, right fluid, right particle for this technique to really work. Now, let me show you the, another video. This shows that once I selected the right phoretic medium, applied the right frequency, I could separate even different sizes of particle very quickly. These are uh, around five microns, I think. Oh, those are 10 microns, I mean 10 microns. These are one micron particles. In the center, you'll see 0 0.5 or 500 nanometer particles. Okay. 
So I could separate three different size particles very quickly using this uh, technique. So basically, this, this force does not scale with, with uh, there's no limitation with size, unlike some other force. Okay? Gravitational force, when the mass is too small, gravitational force is really not that important anymore. But for DEP force, it just goes whenever it has a certain conductivity property, you know, a permittivity property of the material, we can use DEP force to manipulate it. Except that when it's smaller, it becomes more difficult. Okay? You have to apply higher voltage. Now, let's relate this concept to cells. Look at a basic uh, membrane cell model. So cells themselves have uh, you know, some you know, nucleus, uh, cytoplasm, mitochondria, and so forth inside them, uh, this uh, cell system. The membrane itself is another system. Okay? So imagine the cell themselves could, be, could have some kind of permittivity in the membrane, conductivity in the membrane. Inside the cytoplasm actually has its own, its own permittivity and conductivity. So anyways, the equation, you could go through this uh, complex equation to to uh, the com complex model to figure out what happens if you apply a certain electric field around the cell. You can predict how they rotate and what type of DP force will be applied to these cells. But what is the uh, usefulness of this? We conjecture that what happens if we have a bunch of cells and we apply a single DP force around these cells okay, or in the neighborhood of these cells, what would happen? Sure enough, these are uh, uh, lymphocytes. You know, the white blood cells, and some are cancer cells, some are microphage, different type of white blood cells. They go under different rotational characteristics. They rotate at different frequency, and uh, even different rotational axis. Okay? So first thing we thought about is how can we use this to, as a, a cancer cell marker? What happens if cancer cells specifically rotate under different frequency, okay? and different uh, uh, rotational speed under the same applied electric field? And we tried some you know, basic uh, experiments. White blood cells, uh, these are, uh, I've got the S, spleen, spleen white blood cells, okay? And hybridized white blood cells. Basically, you can see that they react at different frequency regime. They you know, react to different positive or negative DP force. But the question is why? Why do they do that, okay? Let me show the, the next slide. For example, these uh, monocytes, melanin A cells, this is their peak voltage, I'm, I'm sorry, applied peak voltage versus the rotational speed. And this is the profile for another type of cell, uh, another type of white blood cell, lymphocytes. They have different frequency peaks, okay? And it's very clear, these two cells, they both rotate. And there was some quote unquote resonant frequency. At certain, at certain frequency applied, they will rotate the fastest. Okay. The, you know, the question is why do they do this? And the interesting fact is that some cells do not even rotate at all, okay? Let me show you the uh, next slide. So for example, this is a raw uh, microfragile cell, a type of white blood cell. They do not rotate at all. But so there, there's two conjectures of why cells rotate. One is the electrical properties are completely different, okay? Maybe because of the per their permittivity properties, the ions will shift back and forth in a certain way that allows the cell to rotate. The other possibility is that maybe the cells inside them, the, the cells they have a uh, uneven distribution of mass. Therefore, when they put in the you know, electric field, they will rotate by themselves. Okay? So we had to test out these uh, different hypotheses. And so you know, we, this is some of the experimental detail that uh, I will not go over. But we tried many different types of cells. And the conclusion is this. Even a cell initially that does not rotate, like a microphage, we made, it, we made, it, uh, made the cell swallow a uh, artificial melanin, and also latex beads, and they will start to rotate, okay? And then they would have the same characteristic as uh, other type of cells that have, have pigments inside already. So, however, the rotation rate and response to frequency is different, okay? So you can see that these cells actually rotate after we make them swallow some uh, uh, latex beads or melanin, artificial melanin inside. So that tells us Maybe the mass distribution, distribution is the most important uh, effect in this, uh, in this work, okay? So far, so far we know that if a cell has certain, a certain uh, pigments inside, certain uh, particles inside, they will certainly rotate. But you have to keep in mind that even though the mass distribution is uneven, but there could be some electrical, electrical properties that make them rotate also, maybe a different axis. So it's not a 100% you know, conclusion that that's the mechanism, but you know, we're still trying to uh, do more experiments to, to uh, 
validate that. But for cancer cells, lung cancer cells, no rotation, okay? I should say real rotation when there's no pigment. For skin cells, no pigment, really. But normal cells with uh, pigment inside, yes. So one thing for sure, as long as cells have pigments inside, they'll rotate under different frequency characteristics. Okay. And, but through this experiment, we found that we can actually determine the capacitance of cells very quickly using the basic formula. It turns out the conductivity of the cells is related to the, uh, what we call the crossover frequency. That means at a certain frequency, these cells will, be under, will undergo attractive or you know, positive DP force. Under other frequency, it'll go through negative DP force. So by using computer imaging, we could actually automatically determine what this uh, F crossover is. From that, we can determine what the capacitance of the uh, membrane is, okay? So this is a direct way of uh, using this technique to determine, determine cell electrical properties. Uh, people in drug discovery were also interested at what phase of a cell's division uh, you know, cycle do they respond to a, a certain medicine? Or how do they respond to a certain medicine? You can see that we've, we've shown that these uh, different, a, a certain cell at different uh, phase of their division, they have different response to the uh, frequency of rotation, okay? The input frequency, I'm, I'm sorry, the free input frequency of the electrical signal. So again, we're trying to work with doctors in the Chinese university, try to use this what we call OEK-based frequency input to determine cells at different phases. I need to mention that you know, one of the, some of the colleagues that I did not mention uh, in my collaborative work was uh, people from computer vision. Okay? And this is a very important aspect of this work. So in order to automate this whole process, we need computer scientists to help us do vision tracking, visual tracking. And so the rotation rate can be calculated very quickly, even uh, almost real time. It used to take my graduate student one week just to figure out the rotational spectrum. With the software, it takes about two minutes, okay? So this is a big help for us. And with computer vision, we could determine uh, different rotational axis. This is impossible to do it by, by uh, you know, human eye, eyesight, okay? And so computer vision is a big thing for us over here. Let me give you another example. So I mentioned earlier, one of the big uh, goals of this work is to separate cancer cells and red blood cells in real time, as fast as possible. These are uh, Rudge cell, which is a type of leuke leukemia, uh, bone, bone marrow cancer cell, okay? These are red blood cells. We can see that they can be separated fairly quickly because there are two factors. First of all, cancer cells and red blood cells are different sizes. Secondly, they have different shapes. You know, cancer cells, you know, uh, I'm sorry, the red blood cells are disc-shaped cells. Cancer cells are more your round type of cancer uh, cells. So they can be separated by DP force very quickly. And if you go into the detailed study, why do they separate very quickly? It's because they go under, they undergo a different acceleration profile when you apply electric field around them, okay? For example, using computer vision again, we can track accurately the position or the trajectory, motion trajectory of the uh, cancer cells and red blood cells as they go across a DP uh, projected line, okay? And you can see that this is the, uh, this would be the distance versus time profile of the red blood cell and also the cancer cell. It's a, there's a clear distinctive uh, difference between their acceleration profile. You could use, uh, let's say, some kind of you know, intelligent neural network methods to, to separate these uh, two data very clearly. So this, this is uh, what our future work uh, holds. We want to go through this type of test for each type of cell and see if we get different type of uh, projection, uh, I should say motion profile of each type of uh, cell and go through this kind of separation mechanism to separate them very fast. Another work that we did was uh, to determine the mass of cells. It turns out that this is an important thing for biologists. It turns out that it's not that easy to determine the mass of individual cells. When you talk about, you ask people, what is the mass of red blood cells? You know, you can look at it yourself, I don't think you'll find a clear answer, okay? Because it's very difficult to do this for individual cell studies. And then cells evolve over time, okay? So usually people give you an average data. They would say, oh, you know, if I have a drop of blood of cells and then this, you know, the average density would be this and mass would be this. But 
there are even you know, scientists that contacted us recently when they saw a paper. They were very excited because this is for the first time we could do this quickly in real time. The principle is very easy. Okay? Like I mentioned earlier, DEP force acts on a certain cell, a uh, certain size, with, with certain uh, electrical, in, in, uh, what do you call it, electrical properties. So imagine this, if we somehow the cell initially is resting on the surface, I inject the DEP force to make it accelerate upwards. Then I turn on the DEP force, let it settle down by itself. Okay? And these are the forces acting on it. So this is your classic sedimentary uh, process, except with individual cells, not a bulk of cells. We do this individually through computer vision again. Then we could figure out that the velocity profile as a function of density is given by this equation. Some fluid mechanics are involved, but uh, eventually we figure out you know, how to uh, find the right coefficients. For example, uh, Stokes' formula predict that this would be the fall trajectory. Okay? Because Stokes' formula does not have a boundary condition on the bottom. So you, could, you have to fix the equation a little bit by you know, giving a, introducing a factor, correction factor into it. You can see that our equation now fits the profile of the cell falling towards the substrate very well. You can see that once you figure out this, pro once you predict the velocity profile, you can predict the uh, density quite well. Okay? So we've done this for at least two or three different types of cells. Uh, even for uh, yeast cells, which are, which are not round, people will ask first, you know, do, do you need to have your cell to be round to, do, to use this method? The answer is no. Even for an uh, uh, oval-shaped cell like this, when you apply DEP force, they align themselves to the electric field. So when they fall down into the uh, fluid medium, this is what the, the image looks like. Okay? It's still the round spherical shape. Based on this, we could track its motion very well. In fact, we compared our method to a recently published method by, by a group from MIT. Uh, our density is right on with them. Okay? The volume has a large fluctuation. It really depends on what type of yeast cells you use. Buoyancy mass in the same order of magnitude. But of course, this depends on the volume also. Okay? The encouraging thing is that our method gives exactly the same density as the, the cells that they have used with their methods. We try this with cancer cells also. Now to illustrate the method again, imagine I accelerate the cell, I make it go up on the fluid, fluidic chip by applying a DEP force and let it fall freely into the fluidic medium. And I use computer vision to track the size of the cell. Based on that, I can uh, get a you know, uh, motion profile of the cell. Then I can use the same equation that I've shown you, I've shown you earlier to determine the, uh, the uh, mass of the cell. However, to do this, you gotta, you know, you got to calibrate the whole process. Then we use different type of beads because uh, even for a particular cell like the, uh, these again are uh, leukemia, leukemia human cells, but a line, these are from, that, uh, from companies. Uh, even you buy from a company, they have different sizes. Okay? So we need to calibrate the different sizes of uh, uh, beads to use it against the cancer cells to measure the mass and density. Anyhow, these are the results. I think they follow you know, pretty beautiful, beautifully if you look at this line over here. Okay? This is just spreading the, uh, the y-axis. <clears throat> and another thing we could use this, is, uh, this technique for is to determine real, I mean, life and dead cells in real time. Up to this day, I mean, if you want to you know, uh, look at whether a cell is alive or uh, dead, you need to use fluorescent technique, which is more accepted. Commonly, okay? But with our method, we know that live cells and uh, uh, dead cells have different mass. We can use determined mass in real time. Use this met the method I discussed in real time, okay? Then you can see this again. We approve that by adding DEP force and by knowing the trajectory, we calculated the mass immediately in real time. Then we validate it by using a real time uh, fluorescence image also. So this is live, this is dead cell. Even if they, they could look almost identical under the microscope. One of the more exciting work that I think uh, we'll be doing in the future is really this. It turns out that human red blood cells tell us a lot about your health state, okay? If you're sick, it seems like your blood, uh, your red blood cells would, I think, contract in volume, and they would have different properties like electrically. We've shown this to be true in maybe three or four patients, so it's not very, uh, we don't have a lot of data yet. But so far what we can see is that for healthy humans, 
two blood cells tend to couple in the rotation, okay? It could be, uh, you know, what we call the uh, dipole-dipole interaction in physics. Uh, if, you're, if we have blood cells from you know, people who are diseased, it seems like it's very hard for these cells to couple. Maybe their ions do not fluctuate as, as fast anymore, okay, as fast as uh, hu human, live human uh, red blood cells. But this is really a uh, speculation. Now we're going to do more experiments. But you can see that once we align these human red blood cells in, in a DP field, we can make them uh, couple in their rotation consistently. Okay, so as a brief summary, I hope I've convinced you that this OEK technique that I mentioned, the optically induced electrokinetics force, is really the way for us to capture, to assemble, to move cells around. Also, we could use various techniques to determine the uh, cell characteristics. And so we could uh, differentiate different types of cells. For example, we could make the cell rotate a certain way so you can image it from all sides. We can uh, you know, look at it, so all this could be done through computer vision, by the way. Uh, so you can look at its rotation speed due to a certain applied electric field to determine, to determine what type of cell that is. But of course, we need to collect a lot of data okay, to do this. Now, with the time that I have uh, left, I would like to tell you a little bit more about what else we can do with OEK. Okay? In this case, we use OEK for some uh, very rapid chemical reactions because we apply localized electric field. Uh, you know, hydrogel polymer is the polymer that's been used by, uh, in biological uh, studies a lot. And usually you've got to define it, you've got a micro pattern using UV lights, right? But using our technique, we do not, we do not need UV lights anymore. We can use uh, visible light, uh, yellow or green or even blue. We could create, we could solidify these structures in real time. That means we could actually trap cells inside these uh, polymer gels in real time. Okay, you identify where the cells are, you shine a certain light on it, it becomes trapped in a cell. And these are the chemistry that are involved uh, that, that, uh, that we understand, because we understand it, uh, that makes these things solidify. But let me show you some of the other more interesting studies using, using this uh, hydrogel. Uh, recently, people have speculated that, you know, we always thought that when a healthy cell becomes cancerous, becomes cancer cell, there's no reversal process. But people have found that, I think Berkeley, uh, Professor Bessel have found that in 2013, he actually, if he applies a mechanical force on it, a cancer cell could revert to a healthy cell, okay? This is fascinating from a biological, biological point of view. How can you make someone, you know, with a cancer tumor, or with a tumor already, you apply some mechanical stress on it, it becomes healthy again, okay? So there are a lot of people studying this effect right now. We use this hydrogel to study uh, basically how breast cancer cells grow do these confinements in, uh, in the hydrogel films. You can see that by regulating the, regulating the uh, microchannel size, these are very, very uh, you know, thin microchannels, and we can vary the width. You can see that cancer cell shapes should be defined by how much or how wide we define these uh, channels. Okay? Anyhow, this is still under study, but we, we've seen that some very uh, interesting data so far that the size of channel has an effect on the cell width and so forth, and how much they could stretch in, in contact with the, uh, the uh, cancer cells in the next channel. We have also done this with uh, brain cells. These are neuron cells, I think. I forgot exactly what they are. N9 cell, protective cells of the brain, yeah, okay. So these are some of the ongoing studies that we're doing with our biological scientists, colleagues. Another aspect of uh, OEK is that we can apply these electric field at well at any spot on the surface. So I, I think some of you have heard of what we call uh, hydrodynamic instability. Okay? People actually have done this before in the past. They would add a very strong electric field between two substrates or two electrodes. And that would generate a phoretic instability at the interface between, let's say, air and fluid. Once they do that, they cannot control the location where these waves would eventually uh, uh, the waveform and so forth, because they were some intrinsic forms. Okay. But we've shown that using OEK, we could actually define these uh, the wave numbers very well, okay? very aligned and very ordered structures. And what are these applications? Just an example. We could make, you know, uh, this is Senyang Institute of Automation. My students done it there at first. And the basic application is that we apply 
this technique to make micro lenses. Okay? For this, in this case, we apply a very high pulse voltage. And where the high pulse voltage is acting on the surface, we create these you know, localized jets, droplet jets. They will go up on the surface. And then due to uh, interfacial uh, interactions, they become deformed lens structures on the top substrate. And these are the mirrors or micro lenses that you can see. I'll show you the next picture. It'll be more clear. The point here is that by adjusting the uh, OEK parameters, you could create different lens diameters and, and, and structures, features that is. Now, this is very interesting for us because uh, recently, in the past five years, many people are looking into what they call near field optics. Although the principle is still under debate, no one, you know, is, uh, there's no agreement among the research community that what exactly people are seeing, okay? But essentially, the key point is over here. You can put a micro bead, okay, a micro mirror under a microscope. We could go beyond diffraction limit. For example, a good microscope, we go around around 300 uh, nanometers. You can see that, okay? With this, you can magnify that uh, number to around anywhere from three to 10 times. That means it is possible, people demonstrate, you can see around, down to around 50 nanometers beyond the optical limit using these micro lenses. So this is really the work that I, I'm interested in. Next. Let me show you, uh, so we're constructing a, basically, a AFM microscope combination with a AFM tip attaching a micro lens or microsphere. We can observe Blu-ray disc uh, features. These features have uh, around, uh, I think they're around 50 nanometers in height, okay? Uh, about 200 nanometers in uh, the width of each uh, line on, on DVDs. And so with a microscope, you cannot see that. But with a, what we call near field optics microscope, you can see this, you can see these features. So now, right now we're, buying, we're writing the computer software to regenerate this. We even have an interferometric image uh, so we can get 3D features using this scanner, okay? So why is this important? Because in the past, AFM have limited scan range. And they, you know, to, in order to get a few tens of nanometers features, you have to create, you have to use a lot of time okay, to do this, to get that feature. With our technique, we, we hope to improve the time by at least 100 times faster. Okay? We have already shown that using near field optics, you could, you could observe around 25 nanometer fluorescent particles uh, under a microscope. So this would be a great big interest in uh, biological research. We can also use OEK to generate what we call nano devices in real time. Okay? That means we can use OEK to, to create nano wires, also nano electrodes. Basically, they're like, uh, I'm sorry, they're much like a small chemical reaction chamber where you can apply localized electric field to increase the uh, chemical reaction in this area. So by projecting these patterns, we're going to create these uh, features we'll show you next, in the next slide. Depending on the concentration and also the electric field, you can create different type of conductive uh, materials. These are silver electrodes. And these are nano wires generated in real time using this OEK technique. Of course, these are some are micro, some are nano. Okay, so to, we really have not that good of a control yet. You can see that by Projecting, projecting light onto the surface. And with the proper solution, you can you know, make these wires grow in real time, in room temperature. Okay, and of course, the next step is try to integrate this whole technique. Creating, converting microfluidics uh, so you could you know, exchange solutions inside the, inside the OEK chip. So you could create nano wires, connective pads, and create nano devices. In fact, we have successfully done that already. Uh, you know, they, you could, we have basic FET working already in this area. So due to the time limit, uh, I'd like to conclude the following points. I hope I have convinced you that OEK is a very flexible technique, okay? It's an alternative to a conventional electro-based DP manipulation strategy. I can actually identify cells based on their morphology, center of mass, electrical properties, and other properties such as mass and density. And I can actually use uh, this technique to separate, to separate nanoparticles with high speed, okay? I have shown you that fabrication of polymers, hydrogels, and others is possible using this. And also fabrication of metals, conductive polymers, and electrodes, and nanowires, also possible this, paving the way for nanosense integration in, in the future using microfluidics. 
Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks very much. <coughs> we now have time for our questions. Yeah, please. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Very Thank interesting. You. Uh, Thank you. So I'm, I don't know much about this technique, but very exciting. I think for for uh, my research, we are making a transistor so mm. it shows like with a few defect transistor. Right. So right. I, I was wondering so for this, uh, like to move the particles, mm -hmm. what's the requirement for the substrate and the, mm -hmm. the, the, the must be right. Right. The okay. Uh, you know, actually, I don't. Th I don't think there's actually particles inside. You could use a regular gold or silver solution, silver nitrate solution. That's enough for this uh, process. So I think it's really a localized electrode deposition process. Okay. Imagine you, you know you have an electrode electro plating solution, right? But this is just localized. Okay. Yeah. So, so you need a substrate. Uh, not totally conductive, it's, it's a photoconductive substrate. Just like uh, what you call uh, solar cell batteries, where you shine light, that's where it's conductive. That's why we're able to pattern these uh, different features on the surface. So for instance, uh, let's say a glass, right, and you put a, uh, what, uh, a form of amorphous silicon, and that will conduct light where you shine light on it. Yeah, that's a basic strategy. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. Do you right. really see the, the accuracy that of OEK oh, no, we, can meet that requirement? No, I, I, don't, I don't think OEK can really meet that requirement because that's, uh, you know, one in a billion is really difficult for, for you know, the, in real life test, right? But right now we prove as much as one to 50. That's not a problem easily, okay? But to really get a, I mean, first of all, how do you count you know, a, a billion blood cells and put a cell of a, one cancer cell in there? That would be very difficult to do. Yeah. That's why the, the entire research community is trying to do this right now with other methods. Yeah. But for laboratory research, I think it's a viable method. Okay. When you have different types of cells and the ratio is about the same, and this would be a very fast and rapid way to do it. Okay. Another challenge is possibly some of the cells have very, very small difference. Right, right, right. The cells. Yeah, yeah. But in fact, you know, in, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure you know that using fluorescence activity method, right? Uh, some people argue that when you, when you put these particles, fluorescent particles inside the cancer cells, or even healthy cells, you change their biological state. You know, they may be toxic to them. It may be electro, electrophil is safer to them. You know? So it really depends on, uh, you know, whether this would apply to a certain application. Okay? If they're exactly the same, then we would think other strategies, like make them swallow in some artificial beads or something like that. So they would have bigger rotational characteristic. Yeah. Just one more question. What yeah. is uh, usually the power of the laser you're needed for? Well, actually, you don't need laser, just the projector light like this. Oh. So it's at least 100,000 times less than laser power. So heating is definitely not a problem for, for our technique. And it's a visible light. So visible light spectrum. You right. don't need to worry if there's damage to you. Exactly, exactly. You don't need UV light at all to do all of this. Yeah. Oh, how can, how can I uh, move the cells around? Okay, let me, let me go back. I'm sorry, I went very fast because of the time schedule. And, uh, but let me go back to explain more detail right now. Okay. Let me see. So let's go to this, uh, this chart. So this, this is the same question that uh, this professor asked, right? You see there's a, in this microfarad chip, we have a top layer and bottom layer, okay? And so the top layer and the bottom layer, they're both uh, could be connected through a, what we call the ITO, indium oxide layer. They're conductive and, and glass. The reason why we use glass is because we want to observe the cells, what's happening with the cells inside. Now on the bottom glass substrate, we, we coat it a layer of uh, amorphous silicon. This is a photoactivated layer, meaning that without light on it, it's, uh, it's an insulator. And where you shine light on it, it becomes a conductor. 
Okay? So when we project the light, it creates a localized electric field. And that electric field depends on frequency applied between these two substrates. It could be a positive or negative DEP force. And that force magnitude depends on frequency. And also the particle size, medium, conductivity, and so forth. Okay. And therefore, you can move this around. Okay. It's different with the optical No, it's very different. Yeah, it's very different. Yeah. This, we, we use in a, uh, we don't need you know, two lasers to trap a certain particle. Okay. And like I said earlier, one of the attractiveness of this technology is that it will not harm your cells through the heat. That's one of the biggest uh, concerns about using lasers. Is this applied to the chemical reaction? Yes. The, Right, right. That's one of the things that why I'm interested in doing the, the silver nitride electroplating process because we really localize the electroplating process, a chemical reaction. Yeah. And even the nanowire, okay, actually you, you're doing a localized chemical reaction there. Depends on what kind of solution you put inside. But that's, that's true, you know, the, the essence of this technique is really how do you localize electric field to control the reaction localized. Okay. And you could, you could change these uh, Localization dynamically also. Okay. Yes. So this fabrication uh, method for making those hybrid gels or mm -hmm. other features, right? Yeah. So those two photon uh, technique can also do that, right? Right. I right. think uh, yours probably uh, a lot less power and in terms of resolution, it's mm -hmm. comparable. Uh, no, two photon process gives you better resolution. The, the difference is that two photon gives you even the th third dimension. Right, right. Okay. We get the third dimension also, but not as high. Okay. The resolution of this depends on really your projector. So based on our setup, it's about three microns right now. But of course, you could replace it with a weak laser. You, know, you could go down to one micron. People have demonstrated that already. Okay. In the process that even for two photon lasers, you need UV wavelength, I think. This does not, just visible, visible spectrum. Uh, on one of your, your last slides, you, you mentioned that uh, this, this method was uh, um, very efficient at separating particles. Mm -hmm. um, how, how does it compare with, say, uh, microfluidics in, in this regard? I, I think uh, it's faster than microfluidics. But in fact, eventually separate, you got to kind of you know, transport these particles to the reservoir that you want. But you still need microfluidics. It's just the microfluidics, they, if they want to separate particles, they're, you know, usually the, the particles of microfluidics are they're large particles compared to this. I could do nanometer scale, not a problem. Even down to 170 nanometers, not a problem. Okay? And I could do this very fast. So I imagine, it like, you know, if I show you this video, uh, this is three different sizes of particles. 10 microns, one micron, and 0.5 micron, 500 nanometers. And just by having this image, I could separate three particles already. And once it's separated, we could think of microfluidic uh, system to transport these particle outside. Okay. To do this in microfluidics, you would have to have electrodes built in. Okay, and you gotta do this you know, one at a time. You would not be able to do this simultaneously. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, yes, carbon nanotube we have tried already. Even it DNA we have tried, it, work, it works. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely the scale of force is not limited to any micron or 100 nanometers. That's why it's effective. But the thing is that when you go to nanotubes, you really have to uh, apply a high electric field. It scales inversely with its particle size. Okay. But it definitely will work. Will work. Yeah. So when, when do you see this technology being applied in, mm -hmm. in science or, or, or in physical sciences or in biology? Where do yeah. you think, where do, what do you think will be the major applications? You know, I, I think one of the, uh, at least person, I, I think the, the most likely way to success is that this is going to be merged with microfluidics. Okay? And we really do cell separation very fast, very efficiently. Much faster than what they have in there using valves and so forth. You can see that this does it in real time, but eventually it has to be merged with a microfluidic transport system to do that. So imagine this uh, is what, what I can see it as is a very fast way to separate cells. 
and then the patient. All these other things I talk about, you know, differential of cancer cells, and you know, this is a very interesting biophysics problem. But I'm not sure if, if biologists will accept it eventually. They still prefer the all reliable, you know, fat fluorescence activated cell sorting system because it's available. It's very easy for them to use. Well, uh, no more questions. I'll ask you to join me in thanking Dr. Lee for, uh, Dr. Thank Lee you. for a fascinating lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.